Thank you, Mikael. Um, has not, I don't know a lot of stuff, but the one thing I've learned over the years is not to trust the small print. So if you look on that, there's two bits of small print which we need to be aware of. The first, and I'm not an expert on Segeti, but when there's a big Segeti and then underneath part of Cap Gemini, which is really small, and I'm guessing that suggests that Segeti doesn't really want to be part of Cap Gemini. <laughs> Or, alternatively, that Cap Gemini does not want to acknowledge that Segeti is part of it. That's the, that's the joke. Less funny is the other one, Utopia for, for Beginners. Uh, and then underneath, there's the fine print. We've got Utopia for Beginning, towards a synthetic future. Uh, so I was asking at the back, what does synthetic mean? And it's one of these horrible Silicon Valley style euphemisms, words that are used that have sort of entered business parlance and have lost, they haven't lost meaning, but, but they've become so vanilla, so diluted that people actually don't think about them. But what towards a synthetic future means is towards a non-human future, because synthetic means a world of AI, a world of post-humans, beyond humans, a world without humans perhaps, a world of algorithms, a world of software. So be aware of the small print. Um, utopia for beginners is all very well, but when, it's, when the small print is towards a synthetic future, you should get a little nervous, which I am. Um, Mikel is encouraging me to be cheerful. I'm the chief unhappiness officer, Mikel, so I can have a little bit of misery in this, right? Yes? No reply. So, the, and let me come to this question too, because uh, this was the last question you guys got asked. Is utopia a radical but defined end state, or should it be a continuous ongoing journey? So it's either an end state or an ongoing journey. But the truth, of course, is it's neither. Um, and, and that's something I think that's been perhaps missed here. Um, you guys, and perhaps I might refer to the Carl and Carlotta show. Uh, Carlotta spoke earlier about, she, 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 she imagined this utopia, this kind of uh, tech utopia. Uh, it sounded a little bit like Denmark or Berkeley, California, where I'm from. Uh, you know, bicycle lanes and everyone being happy. And Carl described utopia as a place where power had been fragmented, so it all exists in online citizen movements. Um, but the, everybody here is treating utopia as a place, as a destination, as a thing, as an actual, um, uh, as, as an actual physical um, uh, destination, and that's wrong. The point about utopia, the meaning of utopia, and I'm not going to quiz a Chicago audience on its knowledge of Latin. But the word utopia means no place. The word utopia was invented by a 16th century Englishman called Thomas More, who wrote a book called Utopia. And through that, over the last 500 years, the, world has, uh, the word utopia has entered our common vocabulary. But the interesting thing, I think, about utopia is firstly, it's always for beginners. By definition, you can't have utopia for experts. Because utopias are always dreamlike existences. Utopias are always challenges. Utopias are always great seductions. And the word utopia means, the one that more used was no place. It was specifically, by definition, a no place. It was a place you can't go. It was a place that doesn't exist. So let's rethink then this whole issue of utopias for beginning and rethink what it means to think about utopias. Why are we so obsessed? We in this room, and I think collectively with this idea of utopia. 
The reason is, is because, as I think Carlotta uh, brilliantly underlined, we're living at a time of enormous disruption, at a time where technology potentially changes everything. A similar time, indeed, in history to the beginning of the 19th century or the five waves of industrial revolution that she described. A time of enormous upheaval where everything changes from culture to economics to the notion of politics to, as Carl said, political parties. Everything's up for grabs. We're living at a time of great upheaval, of uncertainty. Well, all the truths that we took for granted in our age have been turned upside down. It's at times like this, and these moments happen periodically throughout history, that we invent utopias, not as places to go, but as places to imagine the future, to contemplate. Utopias are polemics. Utopias are ways of thinking about our current uncertainty. Moore, in his great work, Utopia, exemplified that. When Moore was writing at the beginning of the 16th century, 500 years ago, the world was in some ways even more uncertain than it is today. Now, of course, today, Utopia for Beginners towards a synthetic future. Who could imagine a world without humans? Who could imagine a world where we are the small print? Where we have become not the thing in itself, but the subtext at best. Maybe just a footnote or something perhaps even worse. But when Moore was writing, he was also writing at a time of enormous existential uncertainty. Where 500 years ago, Western man had discovered that the world wasn't the center of the universe, that they were discovering new worlds. Moore was writing at a time, and this was the polemic in Utopia, of the beginning of capitalism, of the destruction, of the undermining of the old medieval world, the old world of the commons, where all the economic and the sociological and sociocultural infrastructures and assumptions that went with the medieval world were being undermined in the same way as today, what is being undermined are the certainties of the industrial world. Above all else, and this is what really is kind of eerie in terms of comparing our age with Moore's, is that there was a man or a movement in Europe called the, the Reformation or Protestantism, which was challenging the very idea of our power. Um, there were people arguing that God was so immense that it didn't actually make any difference what we did. We were guaranteed salvation or going to hell, irrespective of how we behaved on earth. This was the idea of predestination, which was the core of the Reformation, which Europe fought a 100 or 200 year terrible civil war, bloody civil war over. Now, Moore himself is interesting. Utopia is in some way a kind of nostalgic a nostalgic indulgence to the old medieval world. In Moore's utopia, everyone lived together. There was no God, but there was a commonality, even of men and women, which was very radical, or kind of in a, in a, in a very romantic sense. But there's one thing, I think, in Moore's utopia that's really critical, that's really particularly relevant today. I define it, I, I, I excuse the, the, the cheesiness of this, but I come up with it in my last book, How to Fix the Future. I call it Moore's Law. Now, of course, we all know Gordon Moore's Law of Intel, blah, 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 about the, the motor that drives the digital revolution. But the Thomas Moore's Law that I come up with in my book underlines the role of human agency. At this time of enormous disruption, of uncertainty, where man himself was suffering the kind of existential crisis that made him feel as if he was being turned into uh, the small print. Moore was reminding people in his utopia that we can make a better world. His utopia is a polemic. 
Some of it might be real, some of it is a challenge, some of it is a political critique of an increasingly centralized state of his king, Henry VIII, who actually, a few years after Moore wrote Utopia, executed um, Moore for not obeying Moore, so we have the, the consolidation of the state. But what's really important in Moore's law, in my view at least, in terms of our contemporary relevance, is it's about the, hu the power of human beings. It's about our ability to reshape the world, irrespective of the enormity of the changes, of the technology, of the, uh, the, 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 the existential assumptions that go with it. And I think that's why Carlotta's point was really important earlier today. She reminds us that history is full of periods like the one we're living in. I'm from Silicon Valley, and of course, everyone says, oh, this is the first time it's ever happened, blah, blah, blah. They're always wrong. Engineers, of course, never read history. It's been eliminated from the syllabus in American universities. But Carlotta's point is an important one. It's important because the core issue throughout our history as a species has been making sure that we don't become the fine print that we don't become the supporting act of something else. That's what Moore was worrying about 500 years ago, was encouraging people to shape their world, to challenge, perhaps, the authority of the king, to reinvent capitalism, to give rights to peasants who were being made landless by this new economic phenomenon, to rethinking the nature of the new world, to indeed even rethinking the relations between men and women. So that's the core issue, in my view, in Utopia for Beginners. We always have to think about us. Maybe it's a rather indulgent, narcissistic assumption for me as a, as a member of our common species, but we have a particularly narcissistic president over in Washington, D.C. now, so I think we have a right all to be a little narcissistic, at least from a, a species point of view. Utopia, then, for beginners, is about thinking about our place in this new world. Our place and the uncertainty that goes with it. Because the world that Carlotta described in the 19th century is one where we weren't sure the peasantry was flooding into the towns. You had this enormous inequality between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. You had the environmental consequences of factories. Humans seemed as if they were being turned into the small print, or at least many humans. And today we're living through a similar time. We're seeing it in many ways. Now, I, I liked Carl's optimism, but he's wrong. He's fundamentally wrong. He's wrong that power has been fragmented, that the digital revolution has resulted in the breakup of power. Now we all these citizens, everyone's changing everything. I've never even heard of Bellingcat. I don't know, how many of you have? Exactly. Um, the reality, and this is the problem and the challenge and the reason why we need to think about utopias in our age of AI, in our age of an increasingly technocentric, technocratic world, is that the promise of the digital revolution hasn't been realized. We were promised democratization. We were promised individual empowerment. We were promised that the network would free us from the traditional hierarchies. We were promised all the stuff that Carl was promising you, but it's all wrong. Over the last 25 years, and I've been part of it on both sides, I'm an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley, but I'm also a critic of some of the stuff that's been going on. We've had the consolidation of power. We've had trillion-dollar companies now dominating more and more of the world economy. We have technologies which are increasingly addictive, which are making us into the footnote of our lives. You see the people walking around with their phones, with their smart machines. They're being led by those machines, and they, of course, are being read and undermined by those machines, too. So power hasn't been fragmented. Uh, Mikhail mentioned Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshona Zuboff. Uh, Zuboff's book, it's a brilliant book, it's 600 pages, it's, it's a hard slog, so you might just listen to what I have to say over the next <laughs> 30 seconds. You don't have to pay me, of course. 
Um, Zuboff argues that the world of big data is one in which the large companies, the Googles and the Facebooks, are turning us into the slaves of what she calls surveillance capitalism. It's our data that's being used. It's our data that's being leveraged. It's our data that are turning these companies into trillion-dollar outfits that has made billionaires out of Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and the young men who founded Google. Surveillance capitalism is the reality then, not the fragmentation of power. We have increasing inequality between a tiny technological elite, mostly from Silicon Valley, although from other techn technological areas as well, and everybody else. That is driving the politics of resentment. Carl suggested that, oh, well, power has been fragmented. He's entirely wrong. What we're seeing is a reaction, the consolidation of power. We're seeing the fetishization of nostalgia. We're seeing Trump and Bolsonaro and Orban and Johnson and the National Front in France and Salvini in Italy and Duarte in the Philippines. They're all coming to power and destroying and undermining democracy in the same way because of all the uncertainty. We're seeing then power being consolidated both in economic and in political terms. And of course on the, on, on the long, maybe not so long, medium term landscape is our synthetic future. A place where machines, smart machines, rule the world. A, a place of the hegemony of the algorithm, where the algorithm replaces us at work. So there's no need for drivers, there's no need for lawyers or doctors or engineers. So the world that exists today is in many ways similar to the world at the beginning of the 19th century which drove Marx to write the Communist Manifesto, or the world at the beginning of the 16th century that drove Moore to write Utopia. But both those men, and particularly Moore, Focus not on a pessimism, a laddism, uh, a retreat into monasteries and otherworldliness, but what both Moore and Marx and all major serious political utopian thinkers and writers do are reminding us of our power. So things sure might be bad, we're in shit, sure, but we're always in shit. That's the nature of the human condition. We've lived through the Industrial Revolution. We've lived through that inequality and exploitation, that seeming end of the world. Just read Dickens, read some of the other 19th century writers to imagine the pessimism of that age. We've lived through the collapse of Catholic certainties. We've lived through the, the collapse of the existential idea that we're the center of the universe. So we can deal with this now. And as Mikkel said, we need to focus on how to do it. I love Carlotta's end utopia, or as I said, as there's no end, there's no terminus for utopia. I loved her vision. It's very attractive. As I said, I'm from Berkeley. It's kind of like that there now. Uh, you go and live in Denmark, one or two other places. But the reality is, she laid it out, but she didn't tell us how we're going to get there. She had, she had no suggestion. Well, how are we going to actually do this? And I think that's the challenge and the opportunity. And as Mikkel said, that's what my book, How to Fix the Future, is about. There's a meta theme in the book, which I've already suggested. It's agency. It's the idea that we are empowered to change our world. It's a kind of humanism, maybe think of it as a digital humanism. A humanism that reminds us of our power. Because if there's one sentiment that I think unites everyone in the world today, it's this idea of powerlessness. Oh, we can't change everything. Google and Facebook so large. Oh, big data is so big. Oh, globalization is so enormous that it makes no difference to, to me. But it's about joining. It's about being political. So in that sense, Carl's message is important. I'm not so convinced of Bellingcat. I'm not convinced of some of the other stuff he talked about. But he was suggesting that ultimately the way out of our condition, the way out of the situation, the way to think about utopia is through political action. So what do we do? As, as, um, as uh, Mikhail said, there are five main themes in my book. There are others as well. 
But these themes are all ones that are grounded in history. There are no new strategies. We've been through this time and time again. Some of you may have young kids. You've been through it time and time again when they won't go to bed. You only have a certain number of things you can do. You only have a certain, you're all from corporate, you all have people reporting to you. You only have a certain number of things you can do when you have someone working for you who is no good, who's misbehaving, who's corrupt, who's useless, who needs to be told. You can fire them, you can take them into the office, you can restructure, blah, blah, blah. The same is true with us. The first thing, and Carl mentioned this, is government. The crisis is complicated in the early part of the 21st century. Carl described it in an interesting way. He said the, I, the power has been fragmented. He's wrong, but he's also right to say that the, the legitimacy of power has been undermined. We don't trust the state. We don't trust experts. We don't trust the law. We don't trust journalists. We don't trust politicians. And that's why these charlatans, these narcissists, like uh, Trump and Le Pen are coming to power because they ride on that distrust of authority. But the reality, as we've seen time and time again throughout history, and Carl suggested this, is we have to rely on the state. We have no alternative. So when it comes, for example, to antitrust, when it comes to breaking up some of these large companies, when it comes to making laws that ensure that AI won't be used in warfare, or AI won't replace all of us in the workplace, or that AI won't spy on us, we need the government, we need the state. Europe is leading here, America, as so often, is following. And the Europeans are pioneering a more responsible kind of regulatory regime on big tech. We need government. If you give up on government, you have nothing else. So you'd have someone up here who said, oh, well, you, we've got, uh, what's that new technology called? Uh, the open one, blockchain. Another piece of garbage. Um, <laughs> oh, well, don't worry, you don't need government, you've got blockchain. Yeah, sure, the Chinese and the Russians, they're not going to use blockchain. Uh, the point about all this is technology is not the solution. I'm not against technology. But there are no technological solutions. There are no apps to fix the future. Sure, blockchain can have some value. In my book, I write about the way it's used in Estonia. It's interesting. But blockchain isn't the solution. Government's the solution. Authority used in a responsible, um, constitutional way. So we need government. But we also need new kinds of innovation. We need entrepreneurs to be more responsible. Entrepreneurs who won't turn us into that footnote underneath utopia for beginners towards a synthetic future. We saw this in the industrial age. We need to go back to the industrial age and learn from the past. In the industrial age, car makers created vehicles that weren't death traps, and they succeeded. In the industrial age, food manufacturers produced food that, that wasn't overpriced or addictive or dangerous. And in the end, they won out. The important thing, I think, about our age in the uncertainty is entrepreneurs have an enormous responsibility to make sure that we aren't that footnote. So when they're designing AI products, it needs to be AI products that make us the headline act and not the subtext. Entrepreneurs have a huge responsibility. They fucked up, at least in Silicon Valley, the first time around. People like Zuckerberg are children. They got it wrong. He may grow up. But I have a feeling that Silicon Valley is beginning to grow up. Maybe not Zuckerberg, maybe not the guys still running Google, but there is a new generation, and there's where the hope is of these young people. It's not the digital natives, that's another load of crap. It's young people who have learned from the past. It's young people who understand their responsibility. And you see that more and more in Silicon Valley. Mid-level, young engineers at companies like Google are rebelling. They're saying, no, we're not going to put up with supporting AI that, uses, that, that, that can obliterate the human race, that can make warfare even more nightmarish than it is today. So I think entrepreneurs are also important. Thirdly, we need citizen action on lots of fronts. There are so many ways that we can we can rethink our digital future. From lawyers representing 
uh, Uber or Lyft drivers to make sure that they have proper protection, to parents making sure that, um, uh, that their children aren't addicted to their devices, to investors in Silicon Valley and elsewhere unwilling to invest in products that again are anti-human that will somehow enable a synthetic future which will take away our jobs and power. Citizen action is key. It was key in the industrial age. If we'd have been having this speech in, in, the early, uh, in, the, in 1840 or 1850, and I would have said, well, this world could be improved, you look at me and say, no way, this world out there is terrible. But over the last hundred years, we've had entrepreneurs and social workers and unionists and new political parties all working for a better future. There is no short-term fix. We're very impatient, of course, in the age of Instagram and Twitter. It doesn't happen overnight. It won't happen with a click of a mouse. It won't happen with one app, but it will happen. We also need consumers to be more demanding. When consumers are, for example, presented with products like Google or Facebook, which are turning them into the footnote, which are disempowering them, consumers need to push back. Consumers have a responsibility to read the fine print. They did it with food, they did it with cars, we're no longer driving death traps. Most of us or many of us are no longer or are buying poisonous food. But it needs to be more aggressive. Not only do citizens have responsibility, but consumers have responsibility. Sometimes it's all too easy to make a citizen the sort of the subtext or the footnote to a consumer. They go together. For better or worse, in an age of globalized capitalism, we all have power both as citizens and consumers, and we need to act on it. And finally, last but not least, and this is perhaps this is the long-term relevance, but it's really the most important, is education. Um, the point of Moore's Utopia was education. He wrote this book to get people to think about their world, to think about the inequalities, the injustices, but also the possibility of this new world. Today, we need to think of it in the same way. The thing about AI is that it can't think for itself. The thing about AI is some people say, well, it's our last invention. I think that's wrong. The thing about AI, which we need to remember, is it's our invention. We tell it what to do. AI can't think for itself. AI can't have goals. AI can't be human. But we need to reinvent our education system to realize that. In the industrial age, we had an education system that was trying, essentially, to turn us into all mini-computers, mini-algorithms, because we didn't have computers. We didn't have algorithms. And the industrial education system was a top-down one where people were taught to participate in a two seconds, a role in the industrial age. In the digital age, in the age of AI, in our so-called, quote-unquote, digital utopia, although, as I said, utopia is neither an end state nor a journey. In that world, um, we need to train people, children, perhaps also grown-ups, to be able to work with this new technology. We need to train them and remind them of their humanness. We need to train them and remind them of the very things that technology and the algorithm can't do. It can't think for itself. It can't have goals. It can't be empathetic. It can't be creative. So our education system, in my book I talk about Montessori and Waldorf education, it's the beginning. Maybe, maybe this will uh, trigger some profound change in the education system. But that's the great challenge and opportunity from the point of view of the state and perhaps also entrepreneurs. Because ultimately, I think, the future is analog. You're going to be told tomorrow the future is digital, natives, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is the real value of humans in the digital 20th, 21st century is the analog human. It's the analog human that controls the algorithm, the analog human that has value, that shapes the world, that can do the things that AI can't do, that controls AI rather than being controlled 
by AI. That's my utopia. That's the world I think that we need to be rethinking if we are indeed to build a better world. Rather than utopia for beginners, maybe this speech should have been called reality for beginners. Thank you.